born in Portland, Oregon in 1938, there was a baby that would create one of the most recognizable brands in the world. But before Nike became Nike, that baby had to become the ultimate shoe dog. Time to pull up a chair, grab a fork and dig right into these history nuggets. If you haven't guessed already, that baby's name is Phil Knight. Growing up, Phil wanted to be a journalist, a great novelist, but even more than that, he wanted to be an athlete. At the University of Oregon, he found a way to pursue all three. While studying journalism, he also ran track. He was coached by Bill Bowerman, a man who would help him to achieve great things. Well, about that later. Phil was good at running, but in his own words, not great. Because Phil wasn't as good as other runners, Bowerman experimented by giving him modified shoes. Some modifications worked and some failed miserably. But Bowerman would be miles ahead of anyone. And that, along with his knowledge about running, would make him one of the best coaches in the world. After graduation, Phil still didn't know what he wanted to do. So he ended up doing what a lot of youngsters do, and he joined the army. After serving a year, he decided to go to Stanford Business School. His father was insisting that he become someone respectable with great education and a stable job. But Phil had some other plans. In uni, he produced a paper titled Can do Japanese shoes do to German sports shoes what Japanese cameras did to German cameras? Well, after that, he had a brilliant idea. What if he went to Japan and brought back some shoes to sell to American runners. Flying at that time was quite expensive, so he ended up selling his car and uh, turned out he was still short about a thousand bucks. So he shared his crazy idea with his dad and asked for a loan. His father wasn't too convinced. Since he regretted not traveling in his own youth, he loaned the money to his son. Phil didn't want to go travel the world alone, so he asked his friend, Carter. Instead of dismissing or laughing of the idea, his friend said, that's a swell idea, Buck. So off they went, starting with Hawaii. They spent days enjoying the sun, the women, and surfing. To support themselves, they had to sell encyclopedias door to door, with an exception that Phil was terrible at selling and he wouldn't be able to sell an encyclopedia even if his life depended on it. After a long struggle and a lot of rejection, Phil gave up and started looking for another job. He ended up selling securities. Excuse me, what are securities? Securities are financial instruments like shares, stocks, or bonds. Okay, thanks. As I said, he ended up selling securities for a very famous firm. He made enough money to fund the rest of his trip and decided it's time to go. Carter, on the other hand, decided that he's going to stay with his brand new hot Hawaiian girlfriend. Phil jumped on a plane to Tokyo and after a long and tiring journey, he checked in to the hotel late at night. He woke up overwhelmed by views and sounds of Japan in full swing. He needed someone to help him to get accustomed to this very unfamiliar place. He met a few American guys through his dad's contacts, which recommended him to speak to people who work for the Importer magazine. They really liked his idea. They pointed out that he needs to go to Kobe, where this Japanese company makes its famous tiger shoes. The name of the company was Onitsuka. So Phil arranged an appointment with them in following days and jumped on a train that would take him closer to the idea becoming a reality. He met Onitsuka people wearing a green oversized suit, feeling so out of place. They asked him, Mr. Knight, what company do you represent? Obviously, he didn't have a company, but he really wanted this idea to work. So he quickly improvised and thought of something that he's got in his house. Blue ribbons that are hanging on his wall. Gentlemen, I represent Blue Ribbon Sports. And the Japanese went like, murmuring between each other. 
Phil asked if he could sell their tiger shoes in the US and surprisingly they said yes. They said that they already thought about reaching the American market, so it would be a great idea to place an order now. Excited, Phil got back to the hotel and sent an urgent message to his dad to transfer $50 urgently to the Onitsuka company in Japan. After that, Phil decided to do a little bit more traveling. He traveled to London, Paris, Berlin, Cairo and Athens. In Athens, he got inspired by the temple of Athena Nike, the goddesses of wisdom and victory. But that is not how the Nike name came about. Stay till the end to hear this history nugget. When Phil came back to his home in Oregon, his family treated him like he was a hero. Everybody was impressed by his stories from various places around the world. But on his mind, there was only one thing. My shoes, they still haven't arrived. It wasn't for several months until the shoes arrived. During that time, Phil had to support himself by working as an accountant. He also sent letters to the factory in Japan to find out what's going on. But every time they would respond with a very comprehensive message like the order will arrive in some more days but one day after work he came home to a delivery of 12 pairs of brand new tiger shoes finally his crazy idea became a reality he gave two pairs to Bowerman and set out on a path to sell all the other pairs to his fellow runners his father was still skeptical he was telling him that he's jackassing around with these shoes. But his mother bought a pair from him, giving him $7 from her purse. Bowerman was so impressed with the shoes and the fact that Phil was able to pull this off that he wanted to become a part of this deal. On January 25th, 1964, they shook hands and Blue Ribbon Sports was officially born. Phil would be responsible for selling the shoes at track meetings and Bowerman would come up with an investment and new ideas for shoe designs. They shared their ideas with the Onitsuka company and they were very well received and implemented very quickly. You would think that from then things would get very easy but they didn't. Phil and his little shoe company would face more challenges before it became what it is today. The first challenge was the Marlboro guy. In essence, someone else visited Onitsuka and started importing tigers to the US. It was a former model that was famous for starring in the cigarette commercials. He decided to threaten Blue Ribbon that if they don't stop selling tiger shoes, they will get sued. Phil didn't like to get bullied like that and went back to Japan to speak to the Onitsuka people. He actually spoke to the Mr. Onitsuka himself, the founder of the company. Phil asked to be an exclusive distributor for Western states of United States. Mr. Onitsuka said that Phil reminds him of his younger self, admiring his passion and commitment, and he allowed an exclusive one-year distribution contract in the Western states. During that time, the shoes were selling like crazy and the company doubled its sales within a year. But they were always broke. They spent every cent they made to order more shoes. They were putting a huge strain on their bank account and risking bankruptcy. That's why Phil still couldn't justify taking a salary for himself. And he kept a job as a teacher teaching accounting on the side. Whilst teaching, Phil fell in love with one of his students, Penny Parks, who later got a job in Blue Ribbon and eventually became Phil's wife. Blue Ribbon grew really fast, doubling the sales each following years. But there were more challenges that will face the company along the years. One day, Phil discovered that his contact from Onitsuka, Mr. Kitami, is shopping around the US looking for some uh, 
new shoe distributors. He invited Kitami to his house to change his mind by giving him the best hospitality he can offer. However, during the Kitami's stay, he did something bad. He stole a list of distributors from Kitami's briefcase and shared it with the company team to prove the Onitsuka's betrayal. As a backup plan, Phil decided that they need to find their own factory to produce their own line of shoes. He went to Taiwan, Korea, and Mexico, and he found the new factories, but they needed a new name. Brainstorming and gathering ideas from everyone within the company, they came up with all sorts of crazy names. From animals like a falcon, to Phil's personal favorite, Dimension 6. Can you imagine that the sneakers worn by millions of people, including like people like Michael Jordan, would be called Dimension 6? In the end, just before the production deadline, Jeff Johnson, one of the employees, the most crucial and committed employees, said that he had a dream. And in that dream, he saw the name appear before him. Phil didn't really like the name, but he no longer had any other options on the table. And the time was up. He needed to decide on something. And this name was the best option. Nike was short, punchy, and aimed with a meaning. Nike was, after all, the Greek goddess of victory. The shoes also needed a logo. A few months earlier, Phil hired a young artist to help producing some printed ads. Now, he asked to come up with a logo that would convey emotion. After many tries, they settled on an abstract symbol that we all know and love today. It was the swoosh. A lot of people were asking, what's this swoosh? And the answer is that it is the sound that your competitors will hear when you run past them. In 1977, an inventor, Frank Rudy, came up with a very unique and innovative design. He wanted to put air into the sole of a shoe. That's how Nike Air sole was born. Nikes were boxed in orange boxes that stood out on the shelves of stores. The shoes were flying off the shelves, but there were other troubles on the horizon. Onitsuka discovered that Blue Ribbon is producing its own shoes and decided to take them to court for breach of contract. After a long legal battle with the company, Blue Ribbon won. With the continued success of the Nike shoe, Phil decided to change the name of the company to Nike Incorporated. But once again, the troubles were now over. Soon after, the Nike company received $25 million tax bill. The suspicion was that someone was trying to use an obscure and old tax law to destroy their competitor, Nike. That gave Phil another ordeal to face and overcome. After a long period of lobbying the government officials and searching for a solution, the Nike versus US government case was settled at $9 million. For many years, Phil was hesitant to take the company public because that would destroy the culture they built in the company. But eventually, he figured out a way of going public without giving away the control of the company completely. Nike Inc. went public in 1980 in the same week as Apple. Since then, they became one of the most successful clothing brands in history. They were endorsed by many sports celebrities like Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods. As for Phil Knight, he retired in 2016, releasing his autobiography that was the inspiration for this video. To me, the story of Nike is a story of search for meaning. It teaches us to believe in ourselves and our crazy ideas. It points out how important our relationships with people are and that you will never know when the dots will connect for you in the future. I think this story can be relatable, not just to entrepreneurs, but to anyone in search of the purpose and those who are chasing their dreams.